Linda. Uh, Canon formation has a long history marked by challenge and contention, going back at least as far as the many debates around determining the canonical texts of the Bible. And the challenges to establish canons continue to this day. This is especially true of literary canons, now largely determined by university professors and their classroom anthologies. Our speakers today, my friends and colleagues, Donna Bennett and Russell Brown, are known to many of you as senior college fellows. What you may not know is how central they've been in establishing the university level study of Canadian literature. Or to quote from another of their many admirers, they shape the reception and understanding of Canadian literature. Russell was working on his doctoral thesis on Sir Philip Sidney and Renaissance poetry at the State University of New York, Binghamton, when he met the Canadian novelist, Robert Croach, and quickly developed what became his lifelong interest in Canadian literature. Soon after, he and Donna moved to Lakehead University where that interest deepened. It wasn't long before they joined the faculty at UTSC where they taught Canadian literature and some American literature and literary theory, among other things, for more than three decades. Russell and Donna have each published important articles on a wide range of subjects, but they're best known as editors, usually working together. They produced one of the first anthologies of Canadian short stories, and they published the first and only fully annotated anthology of Canadian literature with Oxford University Press, an anthology they have repeatedly been pushed to revise to keep it up to date. It's a rare student of Canadian literature who has not been introduced to the subject through their discerning guidance. They've also edited the work of many of our most prominent poets, Don Coles, Lorna Crozier, Susan Musgrave, Joe Rosenblatt, Al Purdy. Russell received the Governor General's Award for his edition of Purdy while he was poetry director at McClelland and Stewart. A third area of editorial activity was in journals. They served as co-editors for both Descant and the University of Toronto Quarterly. Their talk today focuses on some of the issues they have faced as editors of a high profile anthology. Please join me in welcoming Donna and Russell. Um, what was wrong is simply my mouse is giving it up the ghost and I couldn't get over to that left hand corner. Um, so it was nice hearing all that, so it was nice. Um, what we are really looking at uh, as, as we've gone through editing can lit. Am I audible? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, is in the last years, and I'm sure all of you know from all of the kerfuffle that's been happening with Duncan Campbell Scott, the problem of what should or shouldn't be in a canon in terms of our desires to read literary work and our desires to recognize that some human beings are not exactly suitable for undergraduate teaching. And that's one of our problems here, how to do that and how to handle it. Okay, before the 1940s, English Canadian literature was little studied in Canadian schools and universities. In the years that followed the Second World War, the anti-Canadian, sorry, anti-colonial um, nationalism developed in the former British colonies, including Canada. Interest in and support of Canada's own culture led to a desire to establish an English can Canadian literary canon. It's actually been many years, people trying to do this, but not having much success. Uh, in forming this new canon, there were uncertainties to be argued over and reprisals to be made. Some writers were drafted, Wyndham Lewis, Malcolm Laurie, and Brian Moore, who would later then be dropped because 
they weren't Canadian enough. If you need explanations for that, we will give them in talk periods. Um, some uh, were seen as never really making the transition into the Canadian part of our literature, but rather too old fashioned or some, something like that. Um, the one that comes to mind mostly is Charles Heavy Sedge. And it's not because of his name, but he did not succeed in, in making the move into the 20th century uh, Canadian canon. Um, Pauline Johnson was and has been in and out right now. She's part of the canon, but um, it depends on what people's tastes are and what they think the works and the writer are about. By the time we found ourselves laboring as Canadian anthologists, the canon had become relatively stable. Our decision to undertake this editorial project was not one we had contemplated. It grew directly out of a classroom experience. One of us, teaching Canadian poetry, began a class with A.M. Klein's poem, Out of the Pulver and a Polished Lens, a poem both playful and deep. It opens, the paunchy sons of Abraham spit on the maculate streets of Amsterdam, showing Spinoza, Baruch, Elias, Benedict, he and his God are under interdict. Discussion of these lines made it quite apparent that none of the students knew exactly who Abraham was, much less Spinoza. None of them had consulted the dictionary for the unfamiliar words pulver and maculate though the related words in their own vocabulary, pulverized and immaculate, might have guided them to the meaning. Part of the problem was the text being used that day. One of the then standard anthologies for Canadian poetry, it had no notes to aid such readers. In class, the students sat mutely, waiting for the explanation. Discussing this experience later that evening, we could see that something was missing in the Canadian classroom, uh, can English Canadian classroom. Uh, students in British and American literature in Canada had their Norton anthologies that supplied them with the material they needed. At that time, those were almost the Bibles of literary survey courses, but the text being used for Canadian surveys really the only one that seemed to have at least a sense of what it should cover uh, was Clink and Water and Reginald Water's uh, Canadian Anthology. That's the name. It had a very good selection of authors combined with very bad habit of shortening the poems and of offering excerpts from longer works. For example, of the nine stanza of out of the clover and polished lens, only stanzas seven and eight were included. Um, elsewhere, some poems had been truncated without any indication. As well, the headnotes for the sections, the selections were terse. Most of them were about 250 words or less. And once again, there were no glosses of any of the poems or short stories are the excerpts from the novels. Let's pause here to reflect on why these anthologies existed. The cultural and literary nationalism of the 1960s and early 70s, led by figures such as Margaret Atwood, who in survival, her thematic survey of Canadian literature, announced that Canada did, after all, have a literary tradition, had accelerated the growth of Canadian literary studies. This growth, suited the nationalism of the times with its assumption that authentic national cultures are those that produced a body of identifiable art, including indeed especially a literary tradition. Representations of national identity or at least identifiable national traits could be found through the study of Canadian literature and should therefore be part of every Canadian education. Thus the age demanded anthologies. But an adequate Canadian anthology had not yet come into being. Recognizing that fact, we contacted Oxford University Press, which was then publishing Atwood, Jay McPherson, and other poets. In 1982 83, 
they published our two volume edition of an anthology of Canadian literature in English, that was the title. By filling the need for a pedagogical anthology, that book proved so successful that it's never been out of print since. Its fifth edition appeared in fall 2019. We edited the first edition in the wake of the 1960s and 1970s hand-lit boom. Recently, it was chronicled, if you want to know about this, in Nick Mount's arrival, by which time a fairly stable Canadian canon had been established. Our real task was to make those texts more accessible. Our role was that of explainers. But we gave a good deal of thought to who should be in and who should be out. In the years since, we have added new writers and works with each edition, and we have also taken people out for various reasons, um, always having to decide how to make room for what we wanted to add. These decisions aren't influenced by several factors. There are shaping forces beyond the sex in every anthology, but especially into the collection of texts intended for classroom use. This, these limits, uh, this limits what we can do. First of all, a classroom anthology is constrained by time and space. It must be neither too short nor too long. In the 1980s, university survey courses in Canada were two terms, a leisurely 26 weeks. Today, they're frequently allotted one 12 week term. In addition, publishers have budget concerns that restrict length of the volume, or in the case of work still in copyright, they limit what can be allotted for permission. And students have their own budget constraints, which also must be taken into account. The first implication of these limits on time and space is that the teaching anthology cannot include many or any long works and ex excerpts are largely scorned. Uh, our initial uh, double volume anthology did include such works um, and that we learned was very hard to get people enthusiastic about teaching and so that's why we shortened it. Poems and short stories are the basic stuff of any anthology. In the history of the Canadian canon, poetry has been the most important form up until the 1960s. And that was really helped our job because poetry is much easier to figure out what you want in and out. As well as many of Canadian Canada's fiction writers have also written short stories and good ones that go along with their, their novels. So that helped us as well. Indeed, uh, some of our writers become famous as short story writers, Alice Munro winning the Nobel Prize. We might add, add at this point that we knew we'd be de dealing mm -hmm. only with English Canadian writing because of strong disciplinary boundaries at most universities as well is because of the general lack of bilingual Canadian literature courses and bicultural Canadian literary anthologies have previously failed. The challenge of the, uh, to these constraints of time and space is the need for representation. A word now often associated with diversity and understood as a way to correct for those who have been taken are not placed in the anthologies previously, particularly women and invisible minorities. However, in Canada, representation also had a geographical dimension. The selections of the Canadian anthology contains, it, it should reflect the way Canada has been and remains highly regional. To be adopted across the country, a Canadian anthology has to have a balance of selections of authors associated with British Columbia, the prairies, and the Maritimes, as well as a judicious number of writers. And I say judicious, 
because of the other parts of Canada, that from Central Canada, Ontario and Quebec, Quebec English writers in Quebec. Um, it must not, especially if edited by two people based at the, at the U of T, seem Toronto-centric. So that's a real requirement that's serious. Um, a further sometimes overlooked constraint on the Canadian anthology is that it must feature teachable works. While this consideration might mean experimental works causing unusual difficulties for student readers get passed over in the selection process. It also means that simple but beautiful poems and stories get underrepresented because they don't need teaching. Every literary instructor values most of all those poems and stories that can be depended upon to generate discussion. A factor we only later became aware of was that once a Canadian literature became a well-established field, instructors like familiarity. Those who have well-designed courses want to keep teaching their old chestnuts. Atwoods, this is a photograph of me, for example, and resist accommodating to too many new works and writers. On the other hand, when new anthologies appear, they do need some new work that recognizes their own era it makes them of and in their time. So uh, we were contacted for the last uh, anthology by Oxford with all of the usual requirements. Uh, they wanted a volume that was shorter than the last one. So this being the fifth edition, um, it had to be shorter by about 10% or just over 100 pages. As usually, usual, they expected us too to be adding new people. So magically, you take somebody away and you magically add them, and somehow it works to that requirement. As usual, they also expected us to be adding. Um, we had known that some of our, our decisions right now on the last anthology was we're going to be largely uh, affected by new social consciousnesses and by new notions about um, ethnicity and uh, what Canada was today, which it hadn't been in earlier volumes. We'd already seen some previously canonical texts raise concerns. When we came to the third edition, 2002, we decided to take out Al Purdy's The Caribou Horses, though it's often spoken of as one of his finest poems, because we didn't think its opening lines still worked in a classroom setting. At 100 Mile House, the cowboys ride in, rolling stagey cigarettes with one hand, raining half tame bronco rebels on a morning gray as stone, so much like riding dangerous women with whiskey colored eyes, such women as once fell dead with their lovers with fire in their heads and slippery froth on their thighs, beaver or carrier women maybe, or blackfoot squaws. By the same logic this time around, we decided to drop now Purdy's whatever else poetry is freedom. It's not because we dislike these poems or didn't want to use them, but what would happen in the classroom setting? Um, this poem has always been seen as, I said Al Purdy, I meant Irving Layton, as Layton's um, essential statement about poetry. It began, I who gave my cake a blackened eye, did to its vivid changing colors, make up an incredible musical scale, no longer, this, seemed, this did not any longer seem to us worth preserving. Um, there were plenty of good poems, both in terms of Curry and Leighton, that they had written and that we could use and they would fare better in classroom discussion. But if it's easy enough to choose a new text to display the talents of an established writer, what happens when a canon has enshrined an author who later readers find reprehensible entirely. 
versions of this question have become prominent and politicized in recent American debates over cancel culture, sometimes comically so, as when even the decision not to reprint out-of-date Dr. Seuss books has become a controversial one. Whether or how much to let the behavior of a writer influence a reader's response is one that most nations must confront. In the US, there's Ezra Pound. As one of the essential architects of literary modernism, removing Pound from the Canadian American canon would distort literary history. But to ignore the fact in the 1930s, he became a virulent anti-Semite and in his public support of fascism during World War II, his, he was eventually arrested and incarcerated. Um, and so to look away from Pound's personal uh, life and only look at his poetry was not uncommon. People were doing that, but it becomes more and more a problem with the notion of, of social reception that is an important element. Pound studied today, particularly in the US, um, it usually ends in, in after the day, appear, he appears in the, the classroom as basically someone who has a shameful history. And students tend to focus on how that changed at least some of his poetic and critical poet practice. Other national canons have their own difficult writers. France has its anti-Semitic Celine, Norway, Knut Hamsen, who supported the rise of Hitler. Austria's Peter Henke received the Nobel Prize in 2019, despite his unwavering support of Slobodan Milosevic and his regime and his policies. And in Canada, we have Duncan Campbell Scott. Before we turn to Scott, let us describe the decision we made on a rather different grounds, one that showed us how much Google search has become a factor. The humorous clockmaker sketches written by Thomas Halliburton, uh, early uh, 19th century uh, writing, uh, he was a, Nova, a Nova, Nova Scotia judge, and he's long been valued as having written important examples of early 19th century prose. Uh, he's also seen as one of the first people to really write um, satire in Canada. So popular, he wrote popular work in newspaper columns, Sam Slick, the Canadian, uh, is a prominent figure in his work, a Connecticut salesman practicing his arts of persuasion on relevant blue noses. And it became so popular that his Slick volume, became, Bond volumes, became one of Canada's first international best sellers. We had reprinted two short sketches from his series in every edition of our anthology. They were both unobjectionable and teachable. Good examples of the satire that shows up in Canada, uh, responding to manners and customs of small communities and showing the uneasy ambivalence that has always tinged American and Canadian re relations. But when we looked back at Halliburton in preparation for the 2019 edition, we discovered that the internet has changed the nature of how Halliburton is received and the discourse around him. In the online discussions, we found that students who searched for more information on Halliburton and his work were finding out that the author held racist and misogynistic views that were common enough in his time perhaps, but quite shocking in our own. In one sketch, Sam Slick spoke about what we might now say are citizens of African descent, using that word that is perhaps now the most forbidden word in the classroom. He described them as those thick-skulled, crooked, shank, flat-footed, long-heeled, woolly-headed gentlemen who don't seem fit for much else but slavery. In another sketch, he argued for the beating of women. You may depend upon it, Squire, 
The only way to tame a shrew is by the cow skin. Grandfather Slick was raised all along the coast of Kent in Old England. And he used to say there was an old saying there, which I expect is not far off the mark. A woman, a dog, and a walnut tree, the more you lick them, the better they be. Well, even without our need to free up pages, dropping Halliburton suddenly seemed easy. The author that presented us with the most substantial problem was Duncan Campbell's phone. Identified with a group of poets of the 90s, later uh, renamed as the Confederation of Poets, he was associated with Charles G. D. G. Roberts, um, Liz Carmen, and Archibald Antman. However, he was initially seen as the least among those four. That changed when E.K. Brown and his canon-making book of 1943 on Canadian poetry reassess Scott's place in the development of Canadian poetry. Where Roberts had once been considered the dean of Canadian poetry and Carmen had also been highly valued, they were given brief treatment in Brown's book. Scott, in contrast, received a full chapter. This upward reevaluation of Scott had begun earlier in 1927 when Raymond Canister had written of Scott's uh, collected poems that many of them could have been conceived only in Canada by a son of Canada to give work indigenous value. Obviously he meant a different thing by indigenous here. Similarly for Brown, as one critic has observed, Scott's position within the canon needed to be understood, not in terms of the consistent quality or substantial quantity of his work, but in terms of his themes and prospect and their place in the cultural nationalist discourse. His novel used to uh, distinctly bring Canadian uh, sorry, materials, uh, and it seemed very important to people at that point. Some of the most successful poems of his writing of his years, such as The Height of Man, marked him as a first great Canadian poet uh, of Canada's northern landscape. His poem at the Cedars had qualities of a Quebec folk ballad, and special interests were of special interest were his several portraits of Canada's Indians. That was the word that was always being used at that point. Um, it, they were understood to be the result of Scott's close observation and contact, which had begun in his youth and were reinforced by his long professional career as a Department of Indian Affairs. In terms of Scott's initial reception in the classroom, this repositioning of him as one of the founders of English Canadian uh, tradition allowed instructors to show their students how a writer can contribute to a national myth and make a parent national identity, thereby to raise the larger issues of literature's relationship to nation. It was very useful in the classroom. It also invited discussions of influence and intertextuality by providing thematic connections with other later works. The problem, however, as many of you already know, is that discussions of Duncan Campbell Scott can now no longer be limited to the realm of the literary or bounded by the classroom. In our time, Scott's standing as a writer has been overshadowed by the knowledge that he was one of the central figures in implementing Canada's most destructive national policy with regard to First Nations people. His work is now shrouded in what the Canadian Encyclopedia calls dark irony, and that his poetic sorrows for dying cultures have to be read in light of what his own Department of Indian Affairs was doing to eradicate those same cultures. The new perspectives on the indigenous peoples that culminated in the 2015 report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada has produced a change in the way we see Scott's work. It demands that we reuse poetry without ignoring his role in Indian affairs. This change in approach did not begin 
until the late 20th century. And it was initiated not by literary scholars, but by Canadian historians. E.K. Brown had described Scott as, I love this quote for its dark irony, an administrator of rare imaginative sympathy and almost perfect wisdom. We, however, have learned instead of the grave harm wrought by Scott in his professional activities. Among those involved in the study of Canadian literature, there was for a while an attempt to resolve this, dis this disjunction between Scott's professional and poetic personas. In 1982, Gerald Lynch depicted Scott as divided between public stances and private feelings, concluding that the former were performative rather than deeply felt and that Scott's poems about Canadian native peoples should still be seen as genuinely sympathetic. I do not doubt, Lynch concludes, that Scott was, in the poems as well as the prose writings, resigned to the inevitability of, insem uh, of insemination, ah, sorry, <laughs> of assimilation, though certainly not the cold-hearted assimilation that critics of the social political school of Scott's criticism read into Indian poems. Brian Titley's 1986 book, A Narrow Vision, Duncan Campbell Scott and the Administration of Indian Affairs in Canada demonstrated arguments by the, uh, his arguments by assembling a well-documented history of statements and actions showing how cold-hearted Scott could be. This watershed work was soon followed by critiques from other historians. Emphasize, uh, epitomized in Bar Ronald Wright's 1982 declaration that Scott was a time-serving Mandarin, but an eager man of letters. He took romantic interest in the native tradition, but living natives were another matter. I'll just note that one of the things that struck us in looking back at these critics was that Lynch says he wants to defend Scott against this socio-political school of criticism, but there wasn't one. We actually cannot find any literary critic that made any real criticism of Scott before Lynch leapt to his defense. And our suspicion is that maybe he was having lunches at acute and discussing people's problems in the classroom and wanted to, to meet the... the uh, problem before it arose. Anyway, it was not until 1994 the literary scholar actually responded to the challenges that were raised by the historian. That was Stan Draglin, who began his career with a PhD thesis on Scott in 1971, and had long been one of Scott's advocates. He found it, however, he could no longer ignore these hard truths. Draglin's own growing interest in ecological criticism and in ethical concerns may have been part of what drew him back to re-examine the charges against Scott. The result was Draglin's remarkable 1994 monograph called Floating Voice, Duncan Campbell Scott and the Literature of Treaty Nine. In it, he seeks to, quote, reconcile Scott's attractive and apparently humane poems and stories about Indians with the dreadful legacy of his administration of Indian affairs. As Tracy Ware's sympathetic review of this book suggests, it's an impossible task. Ware writes, reluctant to blame the writers for the sins of the bureaucrat, Draglin allows the enormity of the administration and the wonder of Scott's best poems to coexist. And he quotes uh, Draglin as saying, compelled to see double as I admire Scott's writing and despise so much of the situation that made it possible. Linda, do you want to show us some of those images uh, that helped uh, indict Scott so strongly in public opinion? Here's uh, a lot of these come from uh, indigenous websites. Uh, here's Scott and a famous quotation. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents who are savages. And though he may learn to read and write his habits and training mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly impressed upon myself as head of the department 
that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men, 1879. Linda, you wanna show us the next one there? Here's another one from an indigenous website, quoting Scott. Um, it is readily acknowledged that Indian children lose their natural resistance to illness by habituating so closely in the residential schools and that they die at a much higher rate than in their villages but this alone does not justify a change in this policy of this department, which is geared toward a final solution of the Indian problem, an ominous uh, phrase to show up at that point. Linda, the next one. Here you can see the transformation they saw it. There's an Indian boy dressed in traditional garb. And as he was seen in a, a residential school uniform. Next, Linda. Here you can see them packed into their classroom, obviously delighted by the instruction they're getting. Next. This is uh, one of the most horrifying photos we have. Uh, Scott's uh, tenure ended, but his policies, the government's policies did not. It's not realized by many how long they went on. What happened was they devolved to the uh, provinces and many of the provinces uh, got even more enthusiastic about the residential schools than the federal government had been. This is a scene in the prairies of what came to be called the 60 scoop, one of the largest removals of children from their parents in the whole history of the uh, residential schools. Here are proud nuns with the infants they're taking away from this family. Um, and the parents. Yeah. The, uh, the policy didn't fully end until the late 80s. Uh, well, actually, the early 80s uh, ended uh, part of it, but there were still some, some isolated incidents after that. That's great. Thanks, Linda. It's clearly no longer possible to see double. The details of Scott's decisions and statements and our knowledge of the residential schools prevent that. There are too many public statements from this man who wrote once, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic. And there is no Indian question. As well, it was something that came to uh, for us to see in, in the late part of uh, the 80s and 90s was a report written by Dr. Preer Bryce, the chief medical officer for, the, for Indian Affairs. And it's been brought back into public record. Bryce documented in 1907, the extremely high morality rate in these schools arising from a communicable disease, malnutrition and overcrowding, very clear in those pictures. Um, he argued very strongly for change in how children were treated. Scott viewed Bryce's report and what he proposed and suppressed the report. It was not visible for a long time uh, until somebody brought it into our uh, Linda, sorry. Linda, do you want to put up the poem for us? Here we go. Here's our one example for you of uh, a Scott poem. It, um, it also contains the foot, brief footnotes we added. It was called the Onondaga Maiden. She stands full-throated and with careless pose, this woman of a weird and waning race, the tragic savage lurking in her face where all her pagan passion burns and glows. Her blood is mingled with her ancient foes and thrills with war and wildness in her veins. 
her rebel lips are dabbled with the stains of feuds and forays and her father's woes. And closer is the shawl about her breast, the latest promise of her nation's doom. Paler than she, her baby clings and lies, the primal warrior gleaming from his eyes. He sulks and burdened with his infant gloom, he draws his heavy brows and will not rest. Donna, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, that the child that has a white father is obvious from these lines. And the elegiac note in this poem has led many of Scott's readers to view the sonnet as a sympathetic betrayal of a tragic situation. It seems much less so when those readers are made aware that in 1914, Scott wrote, the happiest future for the Indian race is absorption into the general population. The great forces of intermarriage and education will finally overcome the lingering traces of native custom and tradition. Even the best known and most beloved of Scott's poems about his Indians, The Forsaken, has more somber notes than it once did. That poem depicts two moments in the life of an indigenous woman. First, we see her as a young mother who heroically keeps her child al alive by using her own flesh to bait a hook and catch a fish. Then she is shown as an elderly woman awaiting the end of her life, her family having abandoned her, quote, because she was old and useless. Critics have treated this second part as a compassionate description of genocide, which was believed in Scott's time to be a common practice among the Inuit and other Northern peoples. Nowadays, there's dispute about the question, uh, about the practice. Contemporary readers have paid more attention to the way the poem calls attention to how the woman's family, quote, slunk away through the islands, left her alone forever without a word of farewell, and how the reader is thereby invited by those lines to judge harshly of such primitive actions. In revising our 2010 edition of the anthology, we, did a, we devoted the fifth of its six paragraphs uh, to a more troubling aspects of Scott's career. In preparing the 2019 edition, writing in the aftermath of the Truth and Reconciliation Report and weighing more carefully than ever before, who or what, would be omitted from the anthology, we knew it was time to give the question of Scott more consideration. We thought about excluding him entirely, but he seemed to loom too large for that. Instead, we reduced the length of his selection and completely rethought our introduction. Dropping the short story that had run 10 pages uh, in previous editions, as well as cutting the height of land and Night Hymns on Lake Nipicon, a poem about the blending of indigenous culture with Christianity, brought the length of his selection from 25 pages to 10. That left us with three most famous Indian poems and three other poems. We thought about replacing the Indian poems, but we realized that in doing so, it would make the issues surrounding Scott's inclusion in the anthology unclear. These were the poems that had helped him make his name. We opened a new headnote in 2019, thus. Duncan Canley Scott has become a pro problematic figure in Canadian history, in the history of the English Canadian literature and in literary canon. His poetry and his fiction and his essays, written from the mid 1880s to the Second World War, can no longer be separated from his actions as one of the prime agents in his government's systematic uh, uh, efforts to assimilate, even eradicate, the indigenous peoples of Canada. While to exclude him from the history of Canadian literature would be to distort the development of literary writing and culture, to look at Scott's writing without considering its larger historical context is no longer possible. 
What followed in our first version of that headnote was that our editor found it too distorting the historical context. And he could no longer see the value in Scott's poetry at all. He asked us to rewrite the introduction and see what we ended up thinking about Scott. We rewrote the headnote seeking to show both Scott's very real literary achievements and his failures as a person, concluding the question now is whether we can still read the Onondaga, Madonna, or even the Forsaken in a way that allows us to balance our recognition of their aesthetic merit with our knowledge of these poems as a record of how the world wants to look to men like Scott and our awareness of how much work needs to be done. In the summer of 2020, I taught an introductory course in Canadian literature to students. It was a course I probably had taught 50 times by that time. I'd originally expected to meet in the lecture halls of Woodworth College, but instead we were now online. Not all our students accommodated equally well to Zoom as the new classroom space, but many flourished and I experienced discussions that were engaged, active and productive. One of the most memorable was the conversation that developed around Duncan Campbell Scott's presence in the course, in the anthology, and in the Canadian canon. Since I'd opened the course with a unit on both early and recent Canadian Indigenous writers, my students were newly sensitive to the issues in the history of Canada's First Nations people. I began my discussion with Scott by asking whether they felt we should still be reading and studying his work. Their response was that we should keep his work in the curriculum, both because of the evil he had done needed to be remembered, and because my students were fascinated by the way they'd gained insight in learning that the, how they read these poems was so different from how they'd once been read, how they'd been read by earlier readers who had not been asked to confront the poem's dark 